Hi, this is Tom from ZeroToFinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through hip fractures. And you can find written notes on this topic at ZeroToFinals.com slash hip fractures or in the orthopedic section of the Zero to Finals surgery book. So let's jump straight in. Hip fractures are common and lead to significant morbidity and mortality. The 30 day mortality of a hip fracture is 5 to 10%. Half of patients become less independent after a hip fracture. Increasing age and osteoporosis are major risk factors for hip fractures. Females are affected more often than males. Due to the morbidity and mortality of hip fractures, they are generally prioritised on the trauma list with the aim to perform surgery within 48 hours. There is a medical specialty called orthogeriatrics and this medical specialty focuses on identifying and optimising the medical comorbidities and complications of inpatients on the orthopaedic ward, particularly elderly patients with hip fractures. A very important aspect of hip fractures is that they can be categorised into intracapsular fractures and extracapsular fractures. Let's start by talking about some basic anatomy. There are some basic structures at the top of the femur. The head of the femur, the neck of the femur, the greater trochanter on the lateral side, the lesser trochanter on the medial side, the intertrochanteric line and the shaft, which is the body of the femur. The capsule of the joint is a strong fibrous structure. It attaches to the rim of the acetabulum on the pelvis and to the intertrochanteric line on the femur. The capsule surrounds the neck and the head of the femur. The head of the femur has a retrograde blood supply. The medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries join the femoral neck just proximal to the intertrochanteric line. Branches of this artery run along the surface of the femoral neck within the capsule towards the femoral head. They provide the only blood supply to the femoral head. The important thing to remember is that the only blood supply to the femoral head comes within the capsule of the hip joint. A fracture of the intracapsular neck of the femur within the capsule can damage these blood vessels, removing the blood supply to the femoral head, and this leads to avascular necrosis. Therefore, patients with a displaced intracapsular fracture need to have the femoral head replaced with a hemiarthroplasty or a total hip replacement. A tom tip for you, it's worth understanding and remembering the concept of the retrograde blood supply to the head of the femur and how this determines the choice of operation, which we'll go through in more detail shortly. When I did an FY1 job in trauma and orthopaedics, the juniors were questioned on this concept almost every time a patient came in with a hip fracture. Being able to identify the type of hip fracture on an x-ray, whether it's intracapsular or extracapsular, and justify the choice of operation made trauma meetings much less stressful. Let's talk about intracapsular fractures. Intracapsular fractures involve a break in the femoral neck within the capsule of the hip joint. This affects the area proximal to the intratrochanteric line, affecting the area above the line between the greater and the lesser trochanter. The garden classification can be used for intracapsular neck of femur fractures. Grade 1 is where the fracture is incomplete and not displaced. Grade 2 is where there's a complete fracture and it's not displaced. Grade 3 is where there's partial displacement and the trabeculi, which form the pattern of the bone, are at an angle across the fracture site. 
and grade 4 where there's full displacement and the trabeculi are parallel. Non-displaced intracapsular fractures may have an intact blood supply to the femoral head, meaning it may be possible to preserve the femoral head without avascular necrosis occurring. They can be treated with internal fixation, for example with screws, to hold the femoral head in place while it heals. Displaced intracapsular fractures, grade 3 or 4, disrupt the blood supply to the head of the femur. Therefore, the femoral head needs to be removed and replaced. Hemiarthroplasty involves replacing the head of the femur but leaving the acetabulum or the socket in place. Cement is used to hold the stem of the prosthesis in the shaft of the femur. This is generally offered to patients who have limited mobility or significant comorbidities. Total hip replacement involves replacing both the head of the femur and the socket. This is generally offered to patients who can walk independently and are fit for surgery. Next let's talk about extracapsular fractures. Extracapsular fractures or fractures outside of the hip capsule leave the blood supply to the femoral head intact. Therefore, the femoral head does not need to be replaced. Intertrochanteric fractures occur between the greater and the lesser trochanter. These are treated with a dynamic hip screw, also known as a sliding hip screw. A screw goes through the neck and into the head of the femur. A plate with a barrel that holds the screw is screwed to the outside of the femoral shaft. The screw that goes through the femur to the head allows some controlled compression at the fracture site while still holding it in the correct alignment. Adding some controlled compression across the fracture improves healing. Subtrochanteric fractures occur distal to the lesser trochanter, although within 5 cm. The fracture occurs to the proximal shaft of the femur. Subtrochanteric fractures may be treated with an intramedullary nail, which is a metal pole inserted through the greater trochanter into the central cavity of the shaft of the femur, and this holds it in place while the fracture heals. Next, let's talk about the presentation of a hip fracture. The typical scenario is an older patient over the age of 60 who has fallen, presenting with pain in the groin or the hip, which may radiate to the knee, not being able to weight bear, and a shortened, abducted, and externally rotated leg. It's worth remembering these three key examination findings of the leg, that it's shortened, abducted, and externally rotated. An essential part of assessing patients with a new hip fracture is to determine any other acute illnesses. There's often a good reason for them to fall and break a hip. They may also be suffering with anemia, electrolyte imbalances, arrhythmias, heart failure, a myocardial infarction, a stroke, or a urinary or chest infection. These conditions need to be identified as early as possible so that the patient can be optimised and surgery can proceed with minimal delays. A tom tip for you, the term mechanical fall is often used to imply a simple explanation for why the patient fell, such as tripping over an object or being knocked over. It's worth exploring the fall in more detail. In many cases, there may be a correctable underlying medical cause for the fall, such as anemia, arrhythmia, or even underlying Parkinson's disease. There may also be social contributors to the fall, such as dehydration, incorrect eyewear, poor footwear, or obstacles in the home. If you identify an underlying reversible cause, you could make a big difference to that patient and also impress your orthogeriatric colleagues. Let's talk about imaging. 
X-rays are the initial investigation of choice. Two views are essential as a single view can miss the fracture. Anterior to posterior or AP and lateral views are standard. Shenton's line can be seen on an anterior to posterior or AP X-ray of the hip. This is one continuous curving line formed by the medial border of the femoral neck and continues to the inferior border of the superior pubic ramus. Disruption of Shenton's line is a key sign of a fractured neck of femur. MRI or CT scans can be used where the X-ray is negative but a fracture is still suspected. Let's talk about management. On admission, patients require appropriate analgesia, investigations to establish the diagnosis, for example x-rays, a venous thromboembolism risk assessment and venous thromboembolism prophylaxis, usually with low molecular weight heparin, preoperative assessment including blood tests and an ECG to ensure they're fit and optimised for surgery, and input from the orthogeriatric team. The NICE guidelines updated in 2017 say that surgery should be carried out either the same day or the day after the patient is admitted, meaning within 48 hours. The operation should allow the patient to wait bare straight after surgery. This allows physiotherapists to start mobilisation and rehabilitation as soon as possible after the operation. Post-operative analgesia is important to encourage the patient to mobilise as quickly as possible. They're less likely to mobilise properly if they're in pain. If you like this video, consider joining the Zero to Finals Patreon account, where you get early access to these videos before they appear on YouTube. You also get access to my comprehensive course on how to learn medicine and do well in medical exams, digital flashcards for rapidly testing the key facts you need for medical exams, early access to the Zero to Finals podcast episodes, and question podcasts which you can use to test your knowledge on the go. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.